Hello there, welcome to Fundamentals of Biology, Lesson 12, where we're going to be having a look at Mendelian genetics. Now this follows on nicely from the previous session where we looked at meiosis, and because what we'll see in this session on genetics is that a lot of the topics that we talk about relate directly to the processes of meiosis. So before we move forward, it, it would pay just to have a quick look at this diagram on the slide so we can do a quick recap of some of the terminology that we covered in the previous session. What we can see on this diagram then is a pair of homologous chromosomes from a pea plant. So pea plants have 14 chromosomes, so two sets of seven. So hopefully you can remember that as humans we have 46 chromosomes, two sets of 23. Well pea plants have two sets of seven one set coming from the male parent and one set coming from the female parent. And what we can see here is a pair of homologous chromosomes. So those would be the same chromosome number that are the same length and carry genes for the same character in the same position. So hopefully you can remember the definition of um, homologous chromosomes. So what we can see is a homologous pair of chromosomes so these are unreplicated so you could if you prefer you could say that you know, we can see single chromatids here but what is highlighted here are the gene for flower color so we're going to be looking at pea plants as we go through but on this particular chromosome at this location or what we refer to as the locus so locus is just the the position or placement on a chromosome that we find a specific gene, what we can see at the locus on this chromosome is the gene for flower color. And we touched on this a bit in the previous session, but we'll look at it a lot more today, is that genes come in slightly different types, because obviously, as we know, we don't all look exactly the same. There are differences in height, in hair color, in eye color, they, we, we have an awful lot of differences between our individuals. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that our genes, which if you remember are just long strands of DNA, so those sections of nucleotide or sequences of nucleotides, well, sometimes they can be slightly different. And that gives us different versions of our genes. And we call those different versions of our genes alleles. So what we can see on the diagram here so let's say the, the top chromosome was this chromosome from the female parent and the bottom one was from the male parent. Well, what we can see here is that the gene for the character of flower color has two different versions of it. On top here, we can see the allele, which will code for purple flowers. And on the bottom chromosome, we can see the allele for white flowers. So we have two different versions of the same gene and we will refer to those as alleles. And when it comes to the flowers of pea plants, there are two different alleles for flower color and they are purple and white. Okay, so that's just recapping on some of the terminology from the last session then, where we talked an awful lot about homologous chromosomes. Well, that's gonna be important again today as well. So what are we gonna be looking at today then? Well, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Gregor Mendel, the, the chap that came up with um, our earliest understanding of genetics. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then we'll get a little bit more into the detail of it. So we'll talk about allele transmission in, and we'll look at mono and dihybrid crosses. So a mono hybrid cross is where we, we cross two parents um, and we're looking at one particular character. And a dihybrid cross is where we would be looking at two characters. Don't worry too much about that for now. We'll get to it in a sec. And then as we go through, you, you, you'll probably be familiar with this term of dominant and recessive genes. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that because we'll see that it's not as easy as that as saying one gene is dominant and one is recessive. That, that kind of dominance comes in, in a few different um, types. So we'll look at those as well. So complete incomplete and co-dominance. And then we'll finish off by talking about something called multiple alleles. And we'll be using blood groups as an example for that. 
So that's the plan of attack for this session. It will be helpful if you have a piece of paper and a pen available, because as we go through this, I will have a few tasks for you to work on, um, a few problems that I'm going to set uh, that you'll need a piece of paper and a pen um, to do that. Okay, so let's begin. So Gregor Mendel was a, um, a monk and he lived from 1822 to 1884 and he studied at the University of Vienna. And he did an awful lot of work with pea plants. That's what he's most famous for. And he wanted to understand heredity. So the, he wanted to increase our understanding of how specific traits and characters were passed down from parents to offspring. He published his main works in 1866, but unfortunately nobody really understood or appreciated the importance of his work at the time, and he died in obscurity, so he wasn't well known at all. And it wasn't until many decades after his death that people started to go back to his findings and realise the significance of them. But he was an impressive man. Um, he was one of the, the early proponents of the scientific method as well. So he was meticulous with his um, scientific recording, so recording his data, drawing conclusions from that. So what did he actually do then? Well, around the time of, of Mendel's life, there was this, people had an understanding that a man and a woman would come together and then they would have a child and that child would look a bit like both of the parents. So it was understood that there was something within us that we gave to our offspring. But it wasn't understood in any way, really, what that was. And instead, it was believed to be something like this blending theory of inheritance. That is, that there was something within the man, something within the woman. And when they had a child together, whatever it was that was in them would be blended together. And then that would be evident in the child. But once blended together, those things were stuck together forever you couldn't separate them out again and it was referred to as this blending theory it was a bit like you take red paint and you take white paint and then you mix them together to make pink paint well you're not going to be able to separate out the red and the white paint again but obviously now we know that that isn't the case at all so it's believed that once blended genetic information was thought to be inseparable but through Mendel's careful and systematic work he was able to show that the blending theory was incorrect. And doing so, he came up and devised his two laws of genetics. And they are the law of segregation and the second law, which is the law of independent assortment. So this is what we're going to focus on over the coming slides. What did Mendel actually look at them? Well, he tried a lot of different species and a lot of different um, types of organisms for his experiments. Uh, but they didn't always work. Um, but what he did do is he stumbled along the pea plant. So he started using the pea plants and he found that they gave very, very good, consistent and replicable results. But essentially, Mendel discovered the basic principles of heredity by breeding garden peas in his carefully planned experiments. What are the advantages of pea plants then for genetic study? Well, there are many different varieties of pea plants and they have very clear, distinct, heritable features or what we would refer to as characters. So if you remember in the last session, I explained the difference between character and trait. So we can see here that something like flower color, so the fact that there are flowers that have color, that would be a character. But then you get the different variants or variations of that flower color. So in pea plants, we get two different types. We get white or purple, or they would be called traits. So the character is the fact that the flowers have color. And then if you have white flowers, that would be a trait. And if you have purple flowers, that would be a trait. Okay, so pea plants have lots of these different varieties or different characters that have a couple of different traits so they were easy to follow and we're going to look at some of these as we go through but you can see them on the diagram so the peas within the pea plant or the seeds as they are will have two different shapes two different traits they will either be round or they will be wrinkled the peas will either be yellow or they will be green the flowers will either be white or purple the pea pods themselves 
will either be this sort of full smooth shape or they will have this constriction between the seeds or between the peas that give them this sort of wrinkled look. The pea pods will either be yellow or green. And then when we look at the stems, you can either have axial um, flowers and buds, which will come off the side, or they will be terminal where they're growing off the end. And you also get a dwarf and tall variety of the pea plant itself. So this made pea plants a really, really good species to study because you've got these very distinct heritable features so lots of different characters that only have two possible traits. That was why Mendel started out with pea plants, but he also found that they were really, really easy to control for his experiments. It's quite easy or very easy to control the mating of these pea plants. And that's because each pea plant has sperm producing and egg producing organs. So if you look at the diagram here on the right hand side, we can see the stamen, well, these are the, the sperm producing organs. And then you have the carpels, so the bit running through the middle here, that are the egg producing part of the plant. So you can control these by removing the bits that you want to get rid of. So if you want to cross this purple plant with a white plant, for instance, and you wanted this one to be the female and the white plant to be the male, well, you just remove the stamen and then just keep hold of the carpal. So it was quite easy to control the mating and you would just be able to take a paintbrush and brush off the pollen and then put it onto the, the female plant or onto the carpal so you could then fertilize it that way. So cross-pollination between the different plants was achieved by dusting one plant with pollen from another, just using a simple paintbrush. These were the reasons that Mendel used the pea plants then. They were easy to control in terms of the mating and they had lots of distinct heritable characters that only had a couple of traits. When it came to a typical experiment for Mendel using the pea plants then, he tended to make two contrasting true breeding varieties. So what we mean by true breeding varieties is that you could take one individual plant and then you could self-pollinate it so you could just keep breeding it with itself over and over and over again and you would keep getting the same traits each time you reproduce them so we could take this purple flowered plant here as an example well if you were to to self-pollinate that or self-fertilize that plant you would get all purple flowered offspring and then if you took those purple offspring and then self-fertilized them again, they would give rise to all purple offspring and so on and so forth. So he would refer to those as true breeding varieties. And what he would do was he would take two different true breeding varieties and he would cross them in a process that is called hybridization. So you can see in the diagram on the right hand side here, you've taken a true breeding purple flowered plant and a true breeding white flowered plant and you're crossing them. So you can see here you're using a paintbrush to take off the pollen from the male and then brushing it onto the purple female. And then that will give rise to some seeds or what we would see as peas. And these would now be hybrids for this one character. So they would be what we would refer to as a mono hybrid. Mono for one, um, for one character, which in this case is flower color. Okay, so this is the process of hybridization. Mendel, when he took the true breeding parents, he labeled them as the P generation or the parental generation. And the offspring from the, the P generational cross, he labeled as F1 or filial one. So the hybrid offspring of the P generation are referred to as the F1 generation. And then if you, or when you breed the F1 generation, they give rise to the F2 generation or filial 2 generation. So this is what we're going to follow through when we look at Mendel's experiments in a sec. So let's start by looking at Mendel's first experiments, then his simplest experiments. And these are what gave rise to the law of segregation. And I'll put this on, I've put this on some text, which will be on the next slide. But let's go through the, the experiment itself first. Mendel took 
Just as we saw on the previous slide, he took a true breeding purple flowered plant and a true breeding white flowered plant and he crossed them. When Mendel crossed contrasting, so purple and white, true breeding flowered pea plants, what he found was that all of the F1 hybrids, so we can see on the diagram here, we're crossing the purple and the white. Here's our F1 generation, so they are hybrid for one character, which is the flower color, and 100% of the, the offspring, the F1 generation, had purple flowers. So at this point, it could be easy to think, well, the blending theory must be true then. We're blending purple and white, or we're breeding purple and white. All of our offspring have purple flowers. Well, that shows that the blending theory is correct. But thankfully, Mendel didn't stop there. What he then did was he took the F1 hybrids, so all of these purple flowered plants, and he crossed them with each other. And what he did then, so he got his F2 generation, and what he noticed was that some of the plants had purple flowers, but some had white again. Some were white as the original true breeding white flowered in the P generation. This was consistent over and over and over again. Mendel didn't just do one or two experiments. He did hundreds of them. And what he discovered was that there was a ratio of about three to one purple to white flowers in the F2 generation. And this was consistent and replicable. So he could do this over and over again. You take a true breeding purple, true breeding white, you cross them, you get 100% purple offspring, but then you cross them and then you get an F2 generation that had the ratio of three to one, three purple flowered plants to one white flowered plant. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail in a bit and we, we can work out an easy way of showing this. But this basically gave Mendel the idea or the basis of his law of segregation, so the first law of genetics. Because we now know about meiosis, keep in mind that Mendel didn't know about chromosomes. He didn't know about genes. We now have a decent understanding of meiosis, so the production of gametes, eggs and sperm. So we can tie this in with the law of segregation really, really nicely. So Mendel's law of segregation then, it states that allele pairs separate during gamete formation, so during meiosis, and then they will randomly unite again at fertilization. So we know this through by looking at meiosis, don't we? We know that there are alternate forms of genes. We call those alleles now. So in this case, for the, for the pea plant, we've got an allele for white flowers and we have an allele for purple flowers. So these are the units which carry heritable characters. And we know that a diploid organism, so we are a diploid organism, we have two sets of chromosomes in our somatic cells, as do the pea plants. Well, we know that they will have two versions of each gene because they have two sets of chromosomes, one from the male parent, one from the female parent. So what Mendel's law of segregation is saying that for each inherited character, a diploid organism has two alleles, one on each chromosome inherited from each parent. And then what we know is that the sperm and egg will only carry one allele for each inherited trait because the allele pairs segregate from each other during meiosis. Well, that's exactly what we looked at in the, the last session on meiosis. So we know that our somatic cells are diploid. They have two sets of chromosomes. But we know that during meiosis, we separate our homologous chromosomes. So we go from, for humans, we go from having 46 chromosomes in the germline cell to having 23 in each of our daughter cells produced at the end of meiosis one. So we separate out our homologs. And that's what this is saying this is what the law of segregation tells us that sperm and eggs only carry one allele for each inherited trait because those allele pairs will separate during meiosis one will go into one daughter cell and the other will go into the other daughter cell and we now know that that happens during meiosis one 
But that is Mendel's law of segregation. If you understand meiosis, then understanding Mendel's first law of segregation is really straightforward because you know it, we've done it. Those alleles will then obviously come together with another one when a sperm fertilizes the egg to give rise to a diploid offspring. And what we now know as well is that when two alleles are different, one will typically be expressed, so you'll be able to see it, um, and we refer to that one as the dominant allele, and the other will be masked, and we would refer to that as the recessive allele. If you think about what an allele is, well, it's just a stretch of DNA that makes up a gene. And what does that do? Well, it codes the, for the production of a particular protein. We've talked about this in previous sessions. So these genes will still code for the production of those proteins. But in a dominant allele, what we'll find is the protein will be much better at doing its job. So it will tend to mask the recessive one. Typically, the recessive one will still code for the production of a protein. There are examples where that doesn't happen, but typically the recessive allele will still produce a protein, but it's just that that protein isn't quite as effective at doing its job as the dominant one. So in the case of Mendel's pea plant flower color, the purple allele is dominant over the white allele because we see the dominant one. It is expressed fully, whereas the white is completely masked, so it is recessive. Another important point on this, there is no magic book to this that you can look at something and you will know instantly whether an allele is dominant or recessive. There's no sort of underlying hidden rule to this. The only way you find out which allele is dominant and which is recessive is by doing the experiments, by doing the crosses and seeing which traits are expressed and which ones are masked. Okay, so I think it's quite easy for, for when students are first learning this that they think they're missing some important information, some sort of archaic information where you should be able to look at a trait um, and tell instantly whether it's dominant or recessive. It's not, that's not how it works. You, you need to be able to do the, the crosses and see which one is expressed and which one is masked. Obviously, with the example that we're using with the pea plants, Mendel has done that for us, so we know which traits are dominant and which ones are recessive. When talking about genetics, there are a couple of terms or a couple of words that are important to remember because we use them frequently, and they are genotype and phenotype. So the underlying allele combination for each phenotype is called the genotype. The genotype will be the allele combination that an organism has, so a diploid organism that we're referring to here. Its genotype will be the combination of the two alleles it has for any particular character. And the phenotype will be the physical characteristics that are portrayed or observed as a result of the underlying genotype. So if we look down at our diagram here, this is the same diagram that was on the opening slide. We can see our homologous pair of chromosomes from a pea plant. And then we can see that its genotype is that it has one allele for purple flowers and one allele for white flowers. So that would be its genotype. Well, what phenotype would this be? Well, we know that this pea plant would have purple flowers because as it carries an allele for purple flowers, and we know that that is dominant over the allele for white flowers, which is recessive, we know that this genotype will give rise to a pea plant that has purple flowers. And when we're talking about the, the different allele combinations, um, and so the genotype, we can assign letters to the different alleles because it makes it easier to work with. So let's look at this example up here that we've just been through on the diagram. So the example, the flower color is the gene that we're talking about. So this is the character that we're talking about, flower color. And we've got, because it's a diploid organism, we have two different alleles. So the first allele is for purple, so for purple flowers, and we know that that is dominant. So we can just assign that you can assign any letters. It doesn't matter at all which letters you use. 
Um, so in this instance, we're using Bs to sign to our alleles for flower color. Because purple is dominant, we give that a capital B. Our second allele that we can see down here is for white flowers. And because we know that the white flower allele is recessive, we give that a lowercase b. So we give it a little b, and then dominant purple is big B. So when we look at our phenotypes then, well, with pea plants, we have two possible phenotypes. The pea plant will either have purple flowers or it will have white flowers. That doesn't necessarily tell us about the genotype of that pea plant. Because as we look here, with the phenotype of purple flowers, we can actually have two different genotypes. So we can have a big B and a little b. So that's what we've looked at up here. So one allele is for purple flowers. So that's our big B. And then the other allele can be the little b. And because the big B is dominant over the little b, which is recessive, this flower will be purple. Or that if we've got the phenotype of purple flowers, the genotype may be big B, big B. So it might have two purple alleles. If we get the phenotype white flowers, well, that's slightly different. There's only one possible genotype that will give rise to white flowered pea plants, and that is the genotype little b, little b. So we'd have to have two recessive alleles to give us white flowers. So if you look at a white flowered pea plant, you know that its underlying genotype for the character or flower color, it will have two white flowered alleles. Because if one of these was a big B, was the purple flower um, allele, well then the phenotype would be purple flowers because that purple flower allele will completely mask the white one. Hopefully that makes sense. So genotype is the underlying allele combination and that will give rise to an observable phenotype. So in this case, it will be the actual color of the flowers. So we've just seen this, that it's possible to have more than one genotype for the same phenotype due to the expression of the dominant allele. So we've just seen that with the purple flowered pl uh, pea plants. You can have the genotype big B, big B, or one big B and one little B. So one purple allele and one white allele and you will still get the same phenotype of purple flowers. And we can describe these combination of alleles as we can see on the slide here. So if you have white flowered plants, because of the, the recessive white flowered alleles, you'd need to have two of them. We would refer to that as homozygous recessive. So homo referring to same, so homozygous recessive because you've got two alleles of the recessive variety, so two white flowered alleles, that would be little b, little b. Or you can have homozygous dominant, so that would be two purple flowered alleles, and we would say big B, big B. Or if you have one of each, they would be classed as heterozygous, so hetero meaning different. Heterozygous would be one big B, and one little b. Okay, so those are our three different allele combinations. So if I quickly go back to the previous slide, we can see the heterozygous genotype here, big B, little b, the homozygous dominant here, big B, big b, and then if we've got the phenotype white flowered flowers, that would have to be homozygous recessive, little b, little b. So what would this diagram show? So we've got one purple and one white allele. What would that be? You're absolutely right. I, I know you've got that right then. We're looking up here. We're looking at the heterozygous genotype. One purple and one white flowered allele. So heterozygous. How can we work through Mendel's genetic problems? Well, we can use something called a Punnett square. This might be something that you've, you've heard of before, or if you've done biology before, Punnett squares is probably something that you're familiar with. So if you get your piece of paper and pen ready, we can work through this one together. And then on the next slide, I'll set you a little problem that you can work out yourself. The example that we're going to look at here 
is the character plant height. So if you remember from the, the one of the early slides, I said that pea plants come in two different varieties in terms of height. They can be tall or they can be dwarf. And what we know is that the, the alleles for those two different traits, well, the tall plant allele is dominant over the dwarf allele, which is recessive. So we will give the, the tall plant allele a capital T, and we will give the dwarf or recessive allele a little t. So when it comes to our possible genotypes, while a tall pea plant can, just like our purple flowers, can have two different genotypes. It can be homozygous dominant, or it can be heterozygous. And then our dwarf plant has to have the genotype homozygous recessive. So this is just like our white flowered plants. That's the only genotype it can have. So this would be our possible genotypes for, for our phenotypes. So what we're going to do is take our P generation phenotype. So we, we know that we've got a tall plant and we're going to cross it with a dwarf plant. So we're going to cheat slightly because we're going to know, we're going to start off by knowing our genotypes of our parents. So we're going to cross a heterozygous tall plant. So it's heterozygous, big T, little t. And we're going to cross it with a true breeding dwarf plant. So we know that that is little t, little t. And the way that we work out our Punnett square is that we put one of our parents. So we know that this is one parent. And it's showing it's two different alleles because it's a diploid organism. We take one parent and we put it down the side. So we put the first allele next to the first box so you can see our big t there we take our second allele so our little t and we put it into the next box so you can see our little t there and then we take our other parent and we take the first allele and we put it here next to this box and then we take our second allele and we put it next to this box it does not matter which parent you put where so we could just as easily have put this parent down the side and this parent at the top it doesn't matter at all but then what we do to work out our genotypes of our offspring is that we go along and we take this T and we put it into this box and then we take this little T and put it into this box and then we take this big T and we put it into this box and this little T and we put it into this box and then same here and same here and then the little T over here and here. So when we complete our Punnett square, this is what we should see. So the big T is there, the little T is there, big T there, little T there, little T, little T, little T, little T. So what we can see in this example is that the offspring that we would get from this cross, so a heterozygote crossed with a dwarf, so homozygous recessive, would be 50% of our offspring would be heterozygous and then 50% of our offspring would be homozygous recessive. So 50% of our offspring would be tall plants and then 50% of our offspring would be short plants or the dwarf variety. Okay, so that's how we can use a simple Punnett square to calculate simple mono hybrid genetic cross problems. So on the next slide, I'm going to set you a little task and then you can have a go at doing one yourself. Okay, so I want you to have a go now at doing your own Punnett square to work out this problem. A breeder of butterflies has found that wing colour is determined by a single pair of alleles, so there are two different versions of the, of the gene, with dominant green, so we're giving it a capital G, big G, or recessive yellow, so lowercase g. So we know that we have two different alleles for the, the character of wing color. We've got green or yellow. Green is dominant, yellow is recessive. If she mates two heterozygotes, what would be the expected ratio of green to yellow butterflies in the offspring? Okay, so she if she mates two heterozygotes, what would be the expected ratio of green to yellow butterflies? So just do a simple 
Punnett square like we did on the previous slide to work this out. So we put one parent down the side, one parent at the top, and then we go, th go through each box and then that will give us an indication of what the likely or expected ratio of green to yellow butterflies would be in the offspring. So I'll give you a few minutes to work through that one and then we'll go through the answers together. So hopefully you all got this right. So we know that green wings are dominant over yellow wings. And so we give the green wings the capital G or big G, yellow wings little g, and we know that we are crossing two heterozygotes. So that means that their genotype would be big G, little g. So we just put one parent down the side, big G, little g, the other parent across the top, big G, little g, and then we just go through and put the, the corresponding allele into each box, so big G and big G. So hopefully you know that that is homozygous dominant, so that would be green wings. But then we go big G, little g, well that's heterozygous, so that would also be green wings. And then we go big G, we just put the big G first, it doesn't really matter if you go little g, big G, but we just tend to put the big G first. So big G, little g, that's also heterozygous. So that would be green wings. And then we've got little g, little g, which would be homozygous recessive. So that would be yellow wings. Using this simple Punnett square, we can work out that the expected ratio of wing color in that cross would be three to one, three green to one yellow. So hopefully you, you got that one right. If not, you can sort of go back over it after the session um, and you can just set yourself little challenges. So what would the outcome be if we were crossing a homozygous dominant with a heterozygote, for instance? So you can work out those and just practice having a go at these simple Punnett squares. Now, if you got that one correct, I've got a slightly harder one for you to do now. In Dalmatian dogs, the color of the spots is determined by a gene with two alleles. Black spot is dominant and brown spot is recessive. Okay, so the allele for black spots is dominant over the recessive brown spot. A breeder wanted to know the genotype of a black spotted bitch. She crossed it with a brown spotted dog and a litter of four puppies, all black spotted, were produced. The breeder concluded that her bitch was homozygous dominant for black spots. Was she right? And you can explain your answer. So this is a slightly more tricky proposition. What I would recommend that you do with this is actually do two separate Punnett squares. She wants to know whether her, I'm going to say female dog, I know it's the correct biological term, but it makes me wince every time I have to say it. She wants to know whether her black spotted female dog is homozygous dominant or heterozygous. We know that the male dog is brown spotted and because brown spot is recessive, we know that his genotype must be homozygous recessive. So do two Punnett squares, one where the female is homozygous dominant and one where the female is heterozygous. And then you can look at the genotype that you get from that cross. Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes. You can assign your own letters to this one. So you can use whichever letters you like. Here is what I was hoping that you would be able to work out. So we know that the black spot allele is dominant over the brown spot allele, which is recessive. So I said to you to do two separate Punnett squares. So here's our first one where our female is homozygous dominant. So we know that the male has to be homozygous recessive because he's got brown spots and because the brown spot allele is recessive. So we put little b, little b down the side. We put big b, big b across the top. And then we work through and every single one of our offspring, so 100% of our offspring, 
are heterozygous. So what would their phenotype be? Well, they would all have black spots because that is the dominant allele. I also said to do a second Punnett square. So we know the male is there, little b, little b, but to do another cross where the female is heterozygous. So big B, little b. So I'm using Bs for the, for the colors here. And if we go through this, what we can see is that 50% of our offspring would be heterozygous, so they would be black spotted, but 50% of our offspring would be homozygous recessive, so they would be brown spotted. So from our litter of four pups, we would expect 50% of them to be black spotted, 50% of them to be brown spotted. But we didn't find that. What the breeder found was that 100% of those puppies that were born were black spotted. So was she right to conclude that her female dog was homozygous dominant? Well, yes. Based on the, the evidence that she has, we would say that the female is very likely to be homozygous dominant. If any of the puppies showed the recessive trait, so that if any of them had brown spots, then she must be heterozygous, but they didn't. I hope that, that makes sense. But again, these are the sorts of things that you can have a go at a few times um, to, to so you can get nice and comfortable with them. Okay, so that was Mendel's law of segregation then. Nice and simple, follows what we know about meiosis quite clearly. And he derived the law of segregation by following a single character. So a couple that we just looked at were flower color and plant height. So either tall or dwarf varieties. And what we saw as we worked through that example, or those examples, was that the F1 offspring produced in our monohybrid crosses were all individuals that are heterozygous for that character. You cross a true breeding purple flowered plant with a true breeding white flowered plant, all of the F1 generation will be heterozygous for that particular character. So they would have one allele for the purple flower, one allele for the white flower. But Mendel didn't stop there. The next question that he, he had was, are particular characters joined together? Do they always appear in offspring as they appear in, their, in the adults, in the parental generation? So for instance, if you had a pea plant that had purple flowers and it also was the tall version of the plant, would the offspring always be tall and purple? Or could you get a white tall plant? Or could you get a purple dwarf plant? So he wanted to know whether these different characters always traveled together from parent to offspring or if they were independent of each other. So Mendel started looking at some dye hybrid crosses. So these were hybridized for two different characters. And it was through these experiments that Mendel developed his second law, the law of independent assortment. Okay, so the law of independent assortment was trying to determine whether genes for specific or different characters always travel together. And what Mendel discovered through carrying out these dye hybrid crosses, and we'll take a look at some of them on the, uh, over the coming slides, was that the genes for different characters do not travel together. They are not stuck together when we start producing offspring. In fact, they will separate from each other independently of each other during gamete formation or during meiosis. So the law of independent assortment states that each pair of alleles, so that will be a pair of allele for flower color and the pair of alleles for um, plant height, they will separate independently of each other during meiosis. Well, the reason that they will separate independently of each other is because they're not even on the same chromosome. They're on completely different chromosomes, so they have absolutely nothing to do with each other. Mendel's law of independent assortment states that each pair of alleles, so a pair of alleles for each character, 
will separate or segregate independently of each other pair of alleles during meiosis. So let's have a little look at the experiment that Mendel did to discover this then. This isn't the prettiest diagram in the world, but we'll break it down and work through it step by step, and then we'll, we'll get a good grasp of what's going on. So let's start up here. So Mendel was looking at the peas particularly for this experiment. And what we know, if you remember from the early slide, um, when we looked at the different heritable characters in pea plants, one of the things that we can look at is pea color. So peas will either be yellow or they will be green. And we can also look at pea shape. So peas will either be round or they will be wrinkled. So yellow and green, round and wrinkled. So what Mendel wanted to try and work out was if you've got a yellow pea, will that always be round? And if you've got a green pea, will that always be wrinkled? Or can you get a green round pea and a yellow wrinkled pea? So this is what he set out to find out. Are those genes that code for yellow and round, are they stuck together? Do they always travel together from parent to offspring or do they separate? Well, we know that he discovered that they separate. So let's work through and look at how he discovered this. That we know that yellow is dominant over green and round is dominant over the wrinkled recessive. Okay, so yellow and round are dominant alleles green and wrinkled are recessive alleles. This true breeding yellow round pea plant will have the genotype big Y, big Y for color. So homozygous dominant for the yellow color, and it will have a big R, big R, so homozygous dominant for shape. Our green wrinkled pea over here will be homozygous recessive for color. So little Y, little Y for green, and it will be homozygous recessive for shape, so little r, little r. What we can do is we can cross our P generation and we will get an F1 generation that are heterozygous for both of those characters. So here's our F1 generation. And you can see here that it's heterozygous for P color, so big Y, little y. But because yellow is dominant over green, these peas will be yellow. And then we can see we're heterozygous for pea shape. So big R, little r. So because round is um, dominant, we know that it will be round as opposed to wrinkled. Mendel then went on to cross the F1 generation to get the F2 generation, just like he did with his law of segregation. If those genes were linked, we can follow the left arrow down here. So this would be classed as Mendel's hypothesis of dependent assortments. That means that yellow and round will always be linked and green and wrinkled would always be linked. So he, if that was the case, he could just do a nice simple Punnett square. So you put each allele combination down one side. So we know that yellow and round are always stuck together. So we'll put one version up there. And we know that green and wrinkled always stick together. So they're down here. And then the same up here and then this would be your expected ratio of offspring that you would get from the f1 cross so you'd get a phenotypic ratio of three green round peas to one green wrinkled pea okay so that was his simple hypothesis but what his results actually showed was nothing like this okay so when mendel crossed his true breeding yellow round, true breeding green wrinkled to get his F1 generation of heterozygous for P shape and P color. He crossed his F1 heterozygotes. If those two different characters were stuck together, so shape and color, this would be what he would expect to get three to one, but he didn't. This on the right hand side is what he actually got. This was his hypothesis of independent assortment and what he actually found when he crossed these F1 heterozygotes was a phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. So a much more complex phenotypic ratio, but he got 9 yellow round, 3 green round, 3 yellow wrinkled and 1 green wrinkled. Okay, so we can now see just from this 
that Mendel's law of independent assortment is actually correct. So this is the hypothesis that was accepted, the hypothesis of independent assortment, because we're not always getting yellow, round, and green wrinkled. So to work this out on a Punnett square is actually a little bit more of a task to do, because now we can have different combinations of those alleles. So if we're going to cross two F1s, so we're crossing two of these together, well, we have to put down on our Punnett square every possible allele combination. So we know that we can mix a big Y with a big R, but we also know that we can have a big Y with a little r, and we know that we can have a little Y with a big R, and we know that we can have a little Y with a little r. And that's exactly what we do. So we put one parent and all of the allele combinations down the side. So here's our big Y, big R. So big Y, big R. Next is our big Y, little r. So big Y and little r. Next is our little Y, big R. So little Y, big R. And then little Y, little r down there. So these are our, all four of our possible allele combinations from that parent. And then we just put the other parent across the top in the same way and then we just go through and we combine our alleles just in the same way that we would with a simple four box Punnett square so we take big Y big R big Y big R so we can see that there yellow round let's go to something a little bit more exotic so here we've got a big Y little R and let's combine that with a big Y little R so we end up with big Y big Y little r little r so that is yellow because it's homozygous dominant for color homozygous recessive for shape so it's wrinkled so we get a yellow wrinkled p okay so we can work out all of our possible allele combinations or all of our possible genotypes to give us those four different phenotypes and again mendel didn't just stop with one experiment he did this hundreds of times and he kept finding the same results, this phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1. That shows us allele pairs will separate independently of each other during gamete formation. The alleles for P color and the alleles for P shaped are not linked together. The problem comes from when we're learning biology is when you're face to face with a problem where you've got to try and work out the, the ratio or the odds of getting a particular genotype from this kind of cross, from a dihybrid cross, it can be a little bit cumbersome because you have to keep doing these four by four Punnett squares and they're not a lot of fun to do. They can take a little bit of time to work out. So there is a quicker and easier way to do this using something called the multiplicative law. Here we have a little test cross that we're going to do then. So we're going to take Mendel's F1 generation from his dihybrid cross, so P color and P shape. Here we can see those, so crossing F1 heterozygotes. So we know that they're heterozygous for P color, so they're big Y, little y, and they are heterozygous for P shape, so big R for round, little r for wrinkled. So we're going to cross these two and what I want to know is what are the odds of the offspring from this cross having the genotype big Y, little y, little r, little r. So that would obviously be the phenotype yellow and wrinkled. So what are the odds of getting that particular genotype from this cross? Now, obviously, we could do that 4x4 four four Punnett square, which... You know, it's quite cumbersome and it takes a bit of time to do it. Yeah, we could work it out in a much, much simpler way by just doing two very straightforward two by two Punnett squares like we've looked at already and use the multiplicative law. So let's have a quick look at how we would do that. So what are the odds of getting this offspring from this cross? We can start off by breaking our cross into the two different characters that we're looking at. So we can break it down into color and shape. So we'll start off by just literally taking the, the color genotype. So we've got big Y, little y, and we're crossing it with big Y, little y. So we put one parent down the side, one parent across the top, like we've done before, and then we just work out our Punnett square. 
And then we can ask ourselves, what are the odds of getting this genotype, so big Y, little y, from this cross? Well, let's work through. We've got a big Y, big Y, big Y, little y. That's what we're looking for. Another big Y, little y, and then a little y, little y. So what are the odds of getting that genotype from this cross? Well, it's two out of four. And then we can simplify that to one out of two. Okay, so the odds of getting that genotype from this cross is one out of two. And then we do the same with shape. So we put one parent down the side, one parent across the top. So we've got big R, little r, big R, little r. And then we just work through again, what are the odds of getting little r, little r from that cross? Well, as we work through, we can see that we only get one out of four. So the odds of getting that genotype from this cross is one out of four. So we've got one out of two and one out of four. And then we can just multiply those two together. So we can multiply one out of one over two by one over four, and that will give us one out of eight. What are the odds of getting this genotype from this cross? Well, it's one out of eight. And let's go back and have a look at Mendel's experiment and we'll double check. So we should expect to see two examples of this genotype in that 16 box Punnett square. So we're looking for big Y, little y, little r, little r. Okay, so here's our Punnett square here. So we're looking for big Y, little y, little r, little r. Well, we know that little r, little r is gonna be wrinkled. So we can look at our four wrinkled peas and we know that big Y, little y will be yellow. So we're looking for yellow wrinkled peas. Well, there's one of our four. That's big Y, big Y, so that's not right. We've got a green one down here, so that's little y, little y, that's not right. If we look at our other two yellows, there we go. Big Y, little y, little r, little r. Big Y, little y, little r, little r. So we've got two out of 16 with that genotype and then to simplify that we would say instead of two out of 16 one out of eight which is the answer that we got for that little test it's much much easier to just break it down because you can do these in a couple of minutes where it you know it might take you sort of 10 15 minutes to do a big four by four punnett square and work it all out so these little tests are, are a lot easier to do by just breaking it down into one character first and then doing the second character um, afterwards. Using that same principle of doing the, the two little Punnett squares, crossing Mendel's F1 heterozygotes again, yellow and round, cross yellow and round heterozygotes, what would be the odds of the offspring having the genotype little y, little y, big R, big R? So I'll give you a few minutes to have a go at working that out, and then we'll go through the answers together in a second. So hopefully you did exactly what we just did on the previous slide. So you broke it down into to the two different characters. So first off, you took the Ys. So we put a big Y, little Y, big Y, little Y, one down the side, one across the top. And then what are the odds of getting this genotype, so homozygous recessive, from that cross? Well, one out of four. So hopefully you got one out of four for that one. And then we took the Rs. What are the chances of getting big R, little r from that particular cross? Well, again, that's one out of four. So one out of four times one out of four is one out of 16. Okay, so the odds of getting that offspring, okay, so that would be a green round P. And what are the chances of getting that offspring from that cross? It's one out of 16. Just to check that we've got that right, we can go back and have a look at the Punnett square again. So we're looking for homozygous recessive for color and homozygous dominant for shape. Here we can see our Punnett square again, and we're looking for a green round P. So we've only got three to choose from here, and we're looking for little y, little y, big R, big R. Well, that one isn't right. That one isn't right. And boom, there it is. So little y, little y, big R, big R. And there's only one of those with that genotype. So one out of 16. 
Okay, so that is a much simpler and quicker way of working out these dihybrid crosses using the multiplicative law rather than working out, drawing out a, um, a four by four Punnett square, which can be a bit unwieldy. So what we've been looking at so far with Mendel's experiments is something called complete dominance. So this occurs when the phenotypes of the heterozygote and the dominant homozygote are identical. Looking at the examples that we've already talked about, if we're talking about flower color, well, we know that purple is dominant over white. So if you've got the heterozygous allele combination, so that would be big B, little b, so one dominant and one recessive, well, you'd still have purple flowers. And if you have the homozygous dominant allele genotype, so big B, big B, that would also be purple flowers. So you have the dominant allele completely masking the recessive one. So that's complete dominance. But dominance comes in a few different types or degrees of dominance. Uh, so I'll give you some examples of some other ones as well. So there's a type called incomplete dominance. So this is where the phenotype of the F1 hybrids is somewhere between the phenotypes of the two parental varieties. It's a bit more like the original blending theory, but again, the alleles do segregate during meiosis, so they're not blended permanently. So I'll give you an example of this on the next slide. And there's a third type of dominance, which is called co-dominance. And this is where you have two dominant alleles that will affect the phenotype in separate but distinguishable ways. Instead of having one allele that is being masked and the other one that is being expressed, you will have two alleles that are being expressed equally. Okay, so we're gonna use blood types as an example for that in a bit. So we've got three deep degrees of dominance that, we, that we've already looked at complete dominance, so where one is completely masked, whereas one is completely expressed, then we've got incomplete dominance where neither one is fully expressed and you kind of get a mix of the two. And then you get co-dominance where both alleles are fully expressed. So let's go through and we'll have a look at the, the two that we haven't looked at yet. In the snapdragon, so it's the type of plant, we find incomplete dominance. So if we take a true breeding white flowered snapdragon plant, and a true breeding red snapdragon plant, and we cross them, our F1 generation will be entirely pink flowers on the plant. So you can see that we've actually got a, a mix of the red and white here. We're not getting red or white, we're getting a mix of the two, so we get this purpley pink color. So the genes for the red and white flowers will give us pink offspring. It's a type of blending and it's caused by incomplete dominance. So let's have a look at the genotypes for the snapdragons then. So we get two different alleles within snapdragons that control the flower color. We get the allele for red. So we, we're just gonna write this as a, as a CR, so color red. And then we have the allele for white, which is CW, so color white. The possible genotypes for the following phenotypes, red will be CRCR, -CR, white will be CWCW, -CW, but if you cross those two, well, you get heterozygous F1 offspring, and they would all be pink, and they would have the genotype CRCW. -CW. So I've got another little task for you here then. Using a Punnett square, so just a simple two by two Punnett square, Calculate the likely offspring genotype ratio from a cross of two heterozygous snapdragon plants. So I want you to do a simple Punnett square crossing two F1 snapdragon plants. So here, here are the genotypes of the parents that we're going to cross. So CRCW by CRCW. So cross those and then let's look at the genotypes and phenotypes of the F2 generation. So I'll give you a few minutes to work that one out and then we'll go through it together. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to work through that. And hopefully what you got looks something like this. So we put one parent down the side. 
CRCW, the other parent across the top, CRCW, and then you just went across and put the parents into each of the boxes, and then what you should have got was CRCR, well, that would be red, CRCW, that's pink, CRCW, that's pink, and then CWCW, well, that's white. What would your phenotypes be from the um, F1 cross in your F2 generation? You would expect to see 25% red, 50% pink, and 25% white. Okay, so that's how we can do a simple Punnett square again for a different type of dominance. So we're looking at incomplete dominance here, and then we can still use those Punnett squares to work that out. Our third type of dominance is codominance. So if you remember, codominance is where you get different alleles that are equally dominant. So they are expressed in equal and distinguishable ways. And the example that we like to use for this is blood and blood types. And blood types are interesting because they're also an example of what we call multiple alleles. So examples of multiple alleles are where you have three or more allele variations involved in determining the expression of a gene. Every example that we've looked at so far have just had two possible alleles for a particular character. So flower color was pink or purple in peas. They, they were either tall or dwarf. The peas were either yellow or green. They were smooth or wrinkled. Everything has just had two possible alleles. But in this instance, where we've got multiple alleles, we can have three or more different alleles within that population. Remember, as an individual, though, because we're diploid organisms, we're only going to ever have two alleles. But within a population as a whole, you can actually have multiple alleles exist. And blood groups, as I said, are an example of that. So let's go through and talk a little bit about blood and why it's so interesting um, and how it comes into this realm of multiple alleles and also co-dominance. So when it comes to blood groups, what we know is that we have four main blood groups within humans, and they are A, AB, B, and type O blood. And you also get positive and negative blood groups, and that refers to something called the rhesus factor, which I'll mention in a bit. And those four blood groups are determined by three different alleles. So we can see our blood groups down here. If you have type A blood, you will have two of the IA alleles. Okay, so you will be homozygous with the IA alleles. If you have type B blood, you will be homozygous with the IB allele. So you will have two IB alleles. If you have type AB blood, you would have one IA allele and one IB allele. And if you are group O or type O blood, you will have two little I's. So both IA and IB are what we refer to as co-dominant. They are equally dominant. So people that have the AB blood will have one each of these alleles and they will express themselves fully. The I is a recessive allele, so that will actually be masked. So people with group A and group B blood, I said just now that they would be homozygous, for, they would be IAIA, but they might actually be IA, little i, or IB and little i. So they could also be heterozygous. Group AB blood will always have one IA and one IB. And people with type O blood can only have little i, little i. So those homozygous recessive alleles. And what do those alleles actually do within our blood? Well, they code for the production of specific antigens. And those antigens, you can see them sort of poking out of our red blood cells here. And they're little tags, little recognition tags that we've talked about previously when we looked at cell membranes. Do you remember we talked about things like the, the glycoproteins, the sugar protein um, cell recognition tags that are attached to the plasma membrane? Well, that's what these antigens are. They are there to signal to the immune system when something is wrong and when something needs to be dealt with. 
people with the IA allele will produce A antigens. So you can see them poking out here. But people with type A blood will also produce in their blood B antibodies. And what those B antibodies will do is they will be searching around in our blood looking for B antigens. Okay, so they will look for B antigens and if they find any, they will attach to them and signal to the immune system that they need to be destroyed. Now, luckily, if you have group A blood or type A blood, you produce the A antigen. So the B antibodies don't have anything to attach to. However, if you were to get a blood transfusion from somebody with either group B blood or group AB blood, well, now suddenly you've got the B antigens. So if we look at group B blood here, we can see that the IB allele codes for the production of the B antigen. So you can see them attached to this red blood cell here. Well, if you were to get a blood transfusion and you've got type A blood and you get a transfusion from somebody with group B or group AB blood, your antibodies or your B antibodies would hunt down these red blood cells they would attach to the B antigens and signal to the immune system to destroy them. Similarly if you've got group B blood while well, you produce the B antigens but you also produce the A antibodies. So A antibodies are searching for the A antigens. No problem unless you get a transfusion from somebody that has type A blood and then that will obviously lead to serious problems as well. If you have type AB blood, so you are heterozygous, so you've got one IA allele, one IB allele, well, you produce both A and B antigens, and because of that, you don't produce either A or B antibodies. If you have type O blood, so you're homozygous recessive, little i, little i, you don't produce either of the A or the B antigens, but you have both the A and the B antibodies. So hopefully that makes sense. There's a little bit of a, a quick run through. Um, I forgot to mention now, I've got the text there that alleles IA and IB are both dominant, so they're co-dominant and I is recessive. Going back to the, the plus or negative, so the, um, the, the rhesus factor, that is just another type of antigen that is produced on the surface of the red blood cells. So if you are rhesus positive, you will produce that antigen. If you are rhesus negative, you will not. And um, most people in North America and Western Europe are rhesus positive. The rhesus negative um, allele is, is actually quite rare. I think it's about 15% of the population is, it has negative blood groups. You might also be aware of the fact that people with type AB blood, they're often referred to as a universal acceptor. And that, that means that they can actually take blood transfusions from anybody else. And that is because they don't produce either of the A, B antibodies. So it's not going to bother them if they take a blood transfusion from somebody with group A or group B blood or group O or type O blood. It doesn't matter because they don't have any of the antibodies. So if you've got type A, B blood, you'll be a universal acceptor. If you have type O blood, these, this is commonly referred to as the universal donator. So anybody can receive blood transfusion from somebody with type O blood because they don't have any of the antigens on them. And the antibodies A and B that are within the blood are, um, are filtered out. They're removed from the blood before the transfusion. So you're not going to get any of those. You're just getting these blood cells that don't have any of the antigens. So they're not going to get attacked by the antibodies A or B in these two types. So hopefully that makes sense. We're seeing here an example of co-dominance. Both IA and IB will express themselves fully, which we can see in, in the type AB blood, which shows both the type A and B antigens around them. But this can lead to some interesting issues when um, people get together and have children, because we get some interesting variations and some interesting outcomes when we start to put some of these crosses into Punnett squares. So I've got a little test for you to do again. So the final task, and I want you to do a simple Punnett square again. So if a man with type AB blood 
marries a woman, oh, that's very old-fashioned of me, but let's say a, a man with type AB blood has a child with a woman with type O blood, what blood types would you expect in their children? So what ratio would you expect of each type? So we know the genotype of a person with AB blood. We know what that has to be. And we also know what the genotype of the woman with type O blood would have to be. So I want you to do a simple Punnett square for that cross. And then we can talk about the offspring and why it could cause some serious conversations and potential arguments amongst that couple when the child is born. So have a work through, give you a few minutes to work it out and then we'll go through it together. So hopefully you've had a chance to work that out and you can see what I was talking about with the, the fact that it can cause some interesting conversations. So hopefully you did this as your, your Punnett square. So we know that the man with type AB blood has to be heterozygous. So he's got one IA um, allele and one IB allele. So we put him up the top. You can put him down the side. It doesn't matter. And then the, the woman with type O blood, well, she has to be homozygous recessive. So she has to be little I, little I. And then we just work through. So we get IA, I, IB, I, and then IAI and IBI. So what are the phenotypes of that? Well, suddenly we've got 50% of the offspring are going to have type A blood. Because remember, IA is dominant, little i is recessive. IB is dominant and little i is recessive. So half of the children are going to have type A blood. And then half of the children would have type B blood. They would both be heterozygous but they would have type A and type B blood. So you could see how this conversation could go. It's like, well, I've got type AB blood, you've got type O blood. How on earth have our children got type A or type B blood? So if you don't understand the, the underlying genetics behind this sort of problem, it can cause some interesting conversations to be had. But anyway, hopefully you, you managed to work that one out and it, it all made sense. So that brings us to the end of that topic. Um, and as always, I think it's useful to do a, a quick recap. So I'll, as always, I'll read through the questions um, and then I'll give you a few minutes to answer them and then we'll go through the answers together. So number one, name three genetic characters found in pea plants. Number two, which of Mendel's laws supports what we see in meiosis where homologous chromosomes separate? Number three, Pea plant flower colour shows what type of dominance? Number four, which of Mendel's laws follows two characters in a dihybrid cross? And then number five, how many alleles determine our four main blood groups? Okay, so I'll give you a few minutes to answer those and then we'll go through the answers together. Okay, welcome back. Hopefully you managed to get some answers for those. Let's go through them together. So number one, name three genetic characters found in pea plants. Well, we looked at several, didn't we? But you could have had pea shape, pea color, flower color, plant height. You could also have had flower position, seed shape, seed color, uh, sorry, pod shape and pod color as well. So there are quite a few to choose from. Number two, which of Mendel's laws supports what we see during meiosis, where homologous chromosomes separate? Well, that was the law of segregation, Mendel's first law. And then number three, pea plant flower color shows what type of dominance? Well, that's complete dominance. So that's where one allele, the dominant allele, completely masks the recessive allele. Number four, which of Mendel's law follows two characters in a dihybrid cross? Well, it's the law of independent assortment. So alleles for different genes will separate independently of each other. And then number five, how many alleles determine our four main blood groups? Well, it's three. We have IA, IB, and then the little i as well. Okay, so hopefully you did okay with those. So that brings us to the end of this session then, where we've, we've covered quite a bit, but hopefully it was okay. 
Um, we've we've had a look at the a bit of a background on basic Mendelian genetics. So we've looked at his two laws, the law of segregation and then the law of independent assortment. We've talked about allele transmission in mono hybrid and dihybrid crosses. And then we've talked about the different types of dominance. So complete dominance, incomplete dominance, co-dominance. And then we've also talked about the fact that there are instances of multiple alleles. So we have multiple alleles that exist within a population. Important to remember, though, that a diploid organism such as us, we will only ever have two alleles for each gene because we are diploid. So we have two sets of chromosomes. But that doesn't mean that there cannot be more versions of that allele within a given population. Um, but hopefully that was useful and I'll see you in the next session. Thanks very much.